My name is Pierre Atlas. I'm a political science professor, and I, I'm, I serve as director of the Richard Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies. Welcome to Marion. Um, most of you are, already are here. Um, and this is a, our, our, our uh, third event um, this year in the Global Studies Speaker Series. And um, I'd like to take a minute to tell you a little bit about the series. And for students, uh, especially for those of you who are not um, uh, seniors, um, tell you a little bit about the Global Studies uh, minor. You might be interested in, in pursuing that. And then we'll, uh, uh, I'll introduce our speaker and we'll get going. Um, the, the Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies, uh, the mission is to shape tomorrow's leaders with global centered, with a value centered global perspectives. Um, we are in our 11th year of the uh, program. And uh, it's, we have a, uh, both the speaker series, which is the public affairs aspect of the center, and we have an academic program in global studies. How many people here are global studies minors? Okay, very good. Um, so the global studies minor is an 18 hour minor that fits with any major in the professional studies or the liberal arts and sciences. It requires a study abroad experience, an extra year of foreign language, and, a, and three uh, uh, special global studies courses. Um, if any of you as Marian students are interested in this, if you, if you wanna study abroad, while you're at Marion, then you should definitely think about minoring in global studies. If you are minoring in a foreign language and you're gonna go up to a second year of language, then you should definitely talk to me about global studies because it'll be very easy to add the minor on. So, and, and at the reception afterwards, uh, we could talk about that program if you're interested. Um, for those of you who are not, on, not from Marion, um, uh, we have uh, uh, Luger Fellow Global Studies Scholarships for incoming freshmen, and we have some Luger Fellow students who are here. And these are generous scholarships um, that help that can be added to other uh, merit-based uh, academic scholarships for students uh, coming to Marion. Uh, another aspect, a really nice advantage of the Global Studies program, um, for those of you who are in it, and some of you have gone on this trip, uh, is uh, the spring break program in Washington, D.C. Every year I take a group of uh, Global Studies students to Washington. We spend the entire week there. Um, we visit uh, with our congressional delegation. We visit the Chinese embassy. We go to the World Bank. Um, we go to the Pentagon. We go to the State Department all sorts of things. It's a very exciting program, very intense. We stay at Catholic University for the week. Um, and uh, some people in this here have gone on it. If you're in the Global Studies program, you're eligible to participate in that um, in your junior or senior year, possibly sophomore year. So again, that's something to talk to me about if you're interested. Um, the uh, speaker series, we have brochures outside. And uh, I just wanna bring to your attention some events that are coming up. Um, all of our events are free and open to the public. And normally we do one event per month. But this month is unusual in that we have two events in November, and our next event is on Monday. And that is with um, Dr. Uh, Pavel Demish, who is a former uh, diplomat from Slovakia. And he is uh, coming to Marion to, to commemorate the 25th anniversary of what's called the Velvet Divorce, which was the peaceful separation of the Czech and Slovak republics. Czechoslovakia broke apart in 1989. Um, and for some of you who might be in my Civil Wars and Ethnic Conflicts class, um, we know what happens normally when, when uh, things break up, it gets very violent, but this was a very peaceful uh, breakup. And he is speaking on Slovakia's post-communist journey in a shifting Europe. And he's a major uh, international uh, affairs uh, expert. And uh, he'll be speaking not only about uh, 25 years uh, afterwards in, in the democratization in a former communist country, but also talking about what's happening in Europe today, including um, his perspective on um, Russia and Ukraine. And this is going to be Monday night, and it's gonna be at the Evans Center Medical School building and um, you're all welcome to attend, and hopefully you will. And then in December, uh, December 7th, Sunday, December 7th, which is the Sunday before uh, finals week, uh, Senate, former Senator Richard Luger will give his annual uh, Global Studies address, and hopefully you will come for that one as well. It should be very interesting, especially now that um, the control of the Senate has switched, and um, he'll, he's always uh, available to talk and answer questions. Then in January, we have uh, John Licklider, who is the chairman and CEO of Eli Lilly and Company, and he will be speaking on perspectives in global health. In February, we have the ninth annual event with Catholic Relief Services, and we're bringing in Carolyn Brennan, who uh, is a, um, the senior communications officer for CRS's global humanitarian response team. She has been all over the world. She's most recently been dealing with refugees in Syria. And she's speaking, uh, her top topic is a field update from the front lines, the most pressing humanitarian emergencies today. And then finally, we wrap up the year officially in March. Um, with a retired Air Force Major General um, speaking on emerging weapons technologies, are we approaching a moral Rubicon? 
and that's our annual global ethics lecture uh, jointly with our center and the Center for Organizational Ethics at Marion. And this uh, is a former, uh, former Air Force general who actually used to command uh, nuclear weapons uh, forces. And um, he's going to be talking about the, uh, basically about uh, uh, battlefield ethics and what happens when we start using drones and other unmanned uh, v uh, weapons. What, what, are the, what are the ethics of that? So it would be very interesting. And then what's not in the uh, brochure but was probably going to happen in um, April um, is uh, we'll probably, uh, we'll, we'll most likely be having Senator Dan Coates um, as our final speaker. Um, we're just waiting to find out when the Senate um, schedule uh, for the spring, for the spring uh, calendar is set up. So it's a very exciting series of events. They're all free and open to the public. Hopefully students, faculty, off-campus people will come. Happy to talk to you about any of those and grab a brochure on your way out or on your way upstairs um, to the, uh, um, to the, uh, br uh, excuse me, to, to the reception after our, after our talk. Also, you'll notice when you walk out after the talk, um, in addition to our table, um, our speaker, uh, Anita, has set up a uh, Mary Knoll lay, lay Missioners table as well. And on that table, there's information about Mary Knoll. If, if any of you uh, uh, students are interested in uh, applying for positions um, after... Applying for positions af after you graduate. Um, there are also uh, uh, collections of free tea from Kenya you are welcome to take. And um, sh they'll also be selling some uh, handmade jewelry from Kenya. That's not free, um, but, uh, so don't take it. But you're, you're welcome to purchase it. So these are all things that are just outside the lobby when, when, you, uh, when you step out. Also, um, for those of you who are off campus, just to make sure you know this, um, you know, uh, Marion has been changing tremendously. We have some alumni here um, uh, to, to celebrate with, with Anita. Um, we're constructing things all over the place. We're building things. One of the downsides of construction is sometimes the construction workers make mistakes, and um, they hit the, uh, the water main. So in case you didn't know, there's no water um, in this building. Um, so uh, unfortunately, if you have to use a restroom, we, we can tell you where to go, but you have to go to a different building for that. Um, but that's, that's, that's the downside of, of uh, building all the, all the new stuff that we're doing. Okay, uh, tonight's speaker um, is part of Marion's Year of the Alumni. And this is uh, our, our contribution of the Global Studies Speaker Series to the Year of the Alumni. And Anita Hess-Klug um, graduated from Marion in 1997. Uh, with a bachelor's in uh, biology and a minor in theology. She's originally from Texarkana, Texas. And um, after uh, leaving Marion, she uh, went to um, uh, the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas, where she acquired a theology um, master's. This is actually Anita's second tour in Mombasa, Kenya, with Mary Nole missioners. Um, she and her husband, Kurt Klug, who was also a Marion student, and they met um, here at Marion and got married. Um, the two of them previously served in Kenya from 2003 to 2007, working with young adults in a vocational school called the Marianist Development Program. Anita served as a social worker and self-awareness teacher. During that time, she facilitated student leadership development, created a school library, and organized workshops and speakers for the school. Anita returned to Mombasa in 2012 with Kurt as a Mary Nolay missioner again and continues to serve there now, currently directing the HOPE Project, that stands for Helping Orphans Pursue Education, which offers orphans basic education and skills to help them find employment, live with dignity, and contribute to the enhancement of their communities. She also oversees several pastoral ministries that support the St. Martin de Porres parish community. Previously, Anita served as a Salesian lay missioner in Montero, Bolivia, working in a girls' orphanage. So between her mission experiences, Anita has worked in both parish youth ministry and campus ministry for over 10 years. Anita and Kurt have two children, Rahima and Bethany, and they were both born in Mombasa, Kenya, while in mission. And they are currently attending school in the Aga Khan Academy, and that's where, uh, and Kurt is in Mombasa now with the kids. So Anita is here with us. Um, where are you? Okay. Uh, please welcome Anita Hesklug. Karibu moyoni mwangu, karibu naku karibishwa, karibu moyoni mwangu. Karibu, karibu, buana. This was the song she sang in prayer and praise of God on her deathbed as we came to visit her in her home. The song says, Welcome into my heart. Come and be near me. Welcome into my heart. Welcome, welcome, Lord. Her name was Rosalind, mother of two girls, and one boy whose husband died of AIDS several years ago. She herself struggled with HIV AIDS 
and her health for many years, but has always tried to keep her family strong and her faith and spirits positive. I first met Rosalind on a home visit after hearing she was hit by a motorcycle <clears throat> driver and could not walk. As I walked with a social worker, Flora, along the dirt roads to her one-room cement home with no electricity or running water, we passed people selling coconuts, selling mitumbo, which is used clothing, and passing the occasional goat and cow along the way. Rosalind shared that she was crossing the road. The motorcycle driver accidentally hit her, knocking her over and hurting her leg. She said she praised God that her life was not taken that day. But this day we visited her was a little different. Rosalind was dying. She had been struggling to support her three children in school and in providing them with a home and food by selling fried fish. This day she could barely sit up on her bed that she had been lying in for two months. The medicines were not helping and she had no appetite due to the thrush in her throat. Her daughter Maximilla, only 17 years old, who is in her third year in high school, tried to go to school, take care of her sickly mother, and care for her, for her siblings. We talked with Rosalind, we offered her food, we brought to help her family a solar lamp, and then she asked us to pray with her in song. Karibu moyo ni mwangu, karibu naku karibishwa, karibu moyo ni mwangu, karibu karibu buwana. Just a few weeks later, only a month ago, Rosalind died and 17-year-old Maximilla has since been coming to the harsh realization that she's the head of the household and she still struggles with her own education, the loss of her mother, and taking care of her brother and sister. Mission is heartbreaking. One's heart is broken and we are moved with compassion. When God reveals his heart through our relationships with the community, those we call poor or less fortunate, the least, the lost, the last, we experience mission. Yet mission can also be aggravating, frustrating, as relationships usually are. Mission is stretching yourself to the limit of love and hope. And it is in hope we continue to build and grow and move forward. This is a traditional African pot. Um, the African people, especially in Kenya, will cook ugali, which basically is um, mushed or boiled cornmeal. They'll cook sukumawiki, a dark green. They'll cook stews. And usually it's placed on three stones. I won't move them, but three stones. Over the three stones, balanced, and then a fire is burned. Usually charcoal, homemade charcoal, or wood that they've picked up. These three stones we'll be serving today as the three stones or the three, st the three pillars of my mission experience. So today I'm going to focus on these three stones, community, compassion, and hope. Mission has been a bridge that connects my heart to the hearts of others and especially to God. And this bridge is ever growing and being built or strengthened the more I experience relationships. Pope Francis said, the home represents the most precious human treasures, that of encounter, that of relations among people, different in age, culture, and history, but who live together and together help one another to grow. For this reason, the home is a crucial place in life where life grows and can be fulfilled because it is a place in which every person learns to receive and give love. Home is such a wonderful word, filled with thoughts of family, loved ones, special place where you feel safe, where you can eat all you want. But home, as the saying goes, is where the heart is. Home for me at one time was Marion University. I was nurtured through many wonderful people, professors, campus minister, staff members, fellow students, and of course, our lovely and ever-committed Sister Norma Rockledge. 
My freshman year, I and another student, Susie, decided to go on a spring break mission trip. And at that time, there were no mission trips or spring break possibilities except to probably go and get drunk in Florida. So we said we wanted to do something a little different. <laughs> so we joined um, a couple universities that were going. Purdue was one. IUPUI, I think, was one. And Sister Norma said, you know, there needs to be something special for you. So she brought us into the chapel, just the two of us. And she put together a little blessing for us. And the scripture she used that day was about the women meeting Jesus at the tomb. And she shared how these women were the first missionaries being sent to tell those disciples, those men over there, that Jesus had risen. And that was the good news. And so she said, we were the women, kind of paving the way for starting the service spring break, spring break mission trips. So I knew from that day that I had a place now in the church. It wasn't just about the men, it was, a, it was also about us women. And so I had a role to play in the church. And that mission was to go out and share the good news. So soon after my time at Marion, I wanted to continue this mission experience beyond our one-week spring break trips. So I joined a group called Salesian Lay Missioners and was sent to Montero, Montero, Bolivia to a girls' orphanage. And in my mind and in my heart, I wanted to do some good. I wanted to save these girl orphans in Bolivia. I wanted to bring them hope and joy, and I wanted to save the world, starting with these little girls. So you can see there's a little I theme going on there. So in the midst of all of this um, love that I was receiving at Marion and all the things my parents and family gave me, I missed the one important message, that it wasn't about me. It wasn't about what I wanted to do and what I wanted to accomplish. It was about we. It was about us. It was about community. So I had a lot of harsh realizations during that time there to get out of the I stage. So when I came back from Bolivia, I was happily married to Curtis Klug, my Marion College sweetheart. We decided that one of the things that we both felt called to do as a couple and eventually as a family to do mission overseas. My daughter, Rahema, was born in Mombasa. After her birth, my husband's parents were coming for a visit. They're sitting right here in the middle. Um, they came to be a part of her baptism. She was just about two months old. And we wanted to, to baptize her in one of the village churches because one of our good friends was a priest in a really, really tiny place called Mibumoni. So we went out there, and it was a typical, typical Kenyan liturgy. Um, I don't know if you can, you can imagine this, but a little tiny church um, surrounded by fields and fields of various plants that you've probably never seen in your life. Um, goats, cows, kind of the typical thing. People carrying in chickens, live chickens, to church. Those are the, that's, that's their donations to church. That's their tithe. Um, and then the, the girls, what they usually do is they dress in these little congas. You can see this one here. They wrap it around and they do little dances up to the um, up to the altar and back, and it's a liturgical dance, and it's this joyful celebration. And a lot of the people that came from this area would walk 45 minutes, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half, just to come to church. And a liturgy is about two and a half hours long. Some of you are probably groaning because you can't make it past 45 minutes, but two and a half hours long. Um, but they're beautiful, they're vibrant, they're joyful. So we come in, and they've got the drums, they've got the shakers, the liturgical dancers, and I'm used to this by now. I'm carrying my two-month-old baby, and I'm sitting in the pews with my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, my husband, and there were a couple little old ladies, Kenyan little old women there, and there was another little baby being baptized that day. And um, one of the Kenyan women, this is pretty typical, she wanted to hold my baby. And I thought, okay, okay. So she grabbed that Rahema and just holding her, holding her, and you know, first reading passes, and I'm thinking, okay, lady, give me my baby. <laughs> and so then there's the second reading. She's still holding my baby. I'm thinking, she's got to be baptized. I need to have her. Then by, finally, it's the gospel. I'm like, okay, come on. <laughs> this is my baby. And finally, Father Joe 
calls us up. It's time for us to have her baptized. And the woman hands Rahama back to me. And it's really interesting because during this time, I'm thinking during all of those readings, all of those thoughts about this Kenyan woman holding my baby. And as he is preparing the baptism and, and talking about what baptism means, a lot of the words started, I started listening to it. And he was talking about um, the children of God, um, this child being welcomed into the family of Christ, being a part of the church community. And I thought, wait a second. This whole time I'm talking about what is mine. And she's not mine. She's God's baby. She's this church's baby. She is Kenya's baby. Um, and that was, again, this harsh realization or this kind of slap into the face that it's about community. Takes me a little while to grow. Si hoja sura bora vitendo. Beauty is nothing. It is actions that count. A Kenyan proverb. Mama Drusilla. She was our neighbor for several years. Um, she lived in a house just right across from us. It had several rooms, but no running water, no electricity. That's pretty typical. She had six older children and so it had a small dukkha, which is a store just outside, very connected to her home. She sold all the basic things like um, freshly laid eggs, tomatoes, onions, garlic, that kind of stuff. And we visited her often and we bought a lot of the stuff that she sold and we chit-chatted a bit and even shared our water with her. Um, during one Easter, we had some missioners who were visiting us from Tanzania. And so I thought, OK, we're in Mombasa. Going to serve them some really great seafood. And I had ordered some the other day, put it in my freezer, and had taken it out. And as the fish were thawing, all of a sudden, this horrible stink, thinking, ugh, Easter feast ruined. Um, so Kurt, my husband, quickly went out to the duca, told Mama Drusilla what happened and that we needed some beans, some rice, and we'd have a little more simple Easter dinner. So about an hour passed um, as we were preparing our beans and rice, and one of Mama Drusilla's daughters came. She was bearing this huge platter full of pilau. It's a meat pilau, basically rice, potatoes, very simple, very flavorful, to share with us and our guests. So this is coming from a family that most likely got or ate meat only once a week. We were honored and in awe at the family's generosity. Um, someone who struggles so much, who has so little, yet who had so much to give and to share. Yet, so this yet again was just another idea of community, an invitation to realize we all have something to share. We all need to be generous no matter where we are in life. One of the foundations of my bridge, as well as one of the three stones that hold up my African pot, is Rahema. Rahema in Swahili means compassion. So Rahema is our firstborn daughter, and she expanded our relationships with the community just by her birth. Kurt and I came in as a couple, um, no children, um, somewhat newly married couple, and we left with two daughters. But one of the blessings that family brought, especially in mission in Africa, um, as a couple, you are not a family until you have children. And so when I was pregnant, and even after Rahema's birth, we learned so much more about our neighbors, so much more about our culture, because they were Kenyan children. They were born in their country. They were not Americans anymore. And so there was a, a lot of just rejoicing and joyfulness. And, so, and part of the culture is also just coming and visiting the new baby, the firstborn. Because when you visit that new baby, she becomes a bless they bring blessings. There's blessings upon blessings brought to the house and to the family. And so obviously she brought so much more to our relationships and to our neighborhood and to what we did just by coming, just by coming. But when she really turned into a toddler, and started walking around is when we started moving about a bit more. So usually I'd just go back and forth to work um, walking, but chasing after my little toddler, she would run into my neighbor's places, which I didn't, didn't even think about asking to go into because they, they really were very, very poor people. 
and she would just run right in, and I'm running after her. Um, and people would just give little snacks, and then all of a sudden, I'm starting to talk to my neighbors. I'm starting to learn more about their families, what's happening. Then they're coming over and visiting more. And so going into mission as a family, not just as a couple, not just as, as a single person, because I've done all that, but as a family, just brought more depth, more understanding. And people felt like, okay, well, you're holding your daughter wrong. Well, your daughter needs to do this. So everyone felt like they had, could share stuff with me. And I, that really deepened those relationships. And I think that was so important in my transition there, as well as, as being, being with and not just working for people. So our child, Rahama, was, was that compassion, that bridge that brought us. Because as children are, they are very trustful. There's, they can run to anyone, no problems at all. And that's how we are ourselves, to run to God and to run to each other. Pope Francis expressed in an interview about seeking converts, your main task isn't to build walls but bridges through dialogue. It is always possible to get closer to the truth, which is a gift of God, and to enrich one another. It is crucial to open minds and hearts. And most of the time, it is not the opening of another's mind or heart, but your own. So I was anxious before Rahama came, both in Bolivia, both in Kenya, very anxious about getting to know people because they're staring at you. I'm very different. In Bolivia, I was not different. I was pretty much the same color, same hair color. But in Africa, I really stood out. Um, so even though I'm of a different ethnic background, I was still an Mzungu, a white person. And so that was hard, just getting used to that, being watched all the time, being asked for the things for things, um, having things expected of me because I was a missioner, because I was a teacher, because I was this. But I think my children, both Rahama and my second daughter, who's Bethany Amani, Amani means peace, helped me realize I didn't need to worry about it. It was about relationships. And sh they both brought us into that and still do um, very quickly. And these are, de these are genuine friendships that we have. Pole, pole, and diom wendo. Haraka, haraka, haina, braka. Slowly, slowly is the way. Quickly, quickly, there is no blessing. My first three years in Mombasa, it was only about a five-minute walk from where I lived um, to the vocational school for young adults that was run by the Marianist brother, brothers. And every morning, I would walk in. I was a social worker. Um, I would walk, walk quickly in, and I would have my to-do list. Again, very American mind. Um, to-do list in my head of what I was going to do. But there was one person um, at the vocational school. His name was Tom. He was the impishi, the cook. And he would always, every single morning, come up to me and say, Anita, how are you doing? It's very important to shake hands. Um, and hold the hand for a really long time, for about 10 minutes. Anita, how are you doing? How's your husband? How are your kids? How's your home? How's your dog? How are things with your family back in America? Like 10, 20 questions. 10 minute long, seriously, every single morning. But one of the thing that, things that I really appreciated about Tom, and also just about the Kenyan culture, is the importance of greetings. The importance of checking to see how are you, and not just about you, because you is also that extended community of you. Your neighbors, your dog, <laughs> your goat, your cows, whatever it may be. And how are those things, because they affect you. And so Tom, was that reminder of what, what it meant to greet and to be with people, the importance of community, and the importance to spend that time and to know the people that you're in relationship with. In scripture, we read that Jesus was, an, was not a man for others, but a man with others. As Christians, instead of fights for the rights of various people, how can be, we be with people, hands-on, in the trenches, so to speak, standing next to and knowing the story of the people in the margins. Wendell Berry said once, you have to be able to imagine lives that are not your own. But in mission, it is not even imagining, but sitting in those places where they sit, walking with them on the roads they walk, sharing in their daily struggles, but re by really listening. 
Father Greg Boyle, a Jesuit of Homeboy Industries, says, The strategy of Jesus is not in taking the right stand on issues, but rather standing in the right place with the outcast and those neglected to the margins. And marginalized people are in every country, every city, and you don't need to travel to Kenya or to Bolivia to fill, fulfill that mission call. So Kurt and I are co-directors of the HOPE Project. HOPE stands for Helping Orphans Pursue Education, and it's a project connected to HIV AIDS community-based healthcare clinic. And our project has been under the Mary Nolle Missioners for over 14 years, supports about 100 students per year in Mombasa who are infected or affected by HIV AIDS. So we help with school fees, uniforms, shoes, tutoring, library, and then this year our big thing was purchasing a solar lamp for every family. And it's been such a blessing for us um, as far as a ministry for our family because our, our daughters get to be included. Um, our daughters go to an international or an IB um, program school called Aga Khan Academy. And so it is surrounded by a lot, of, a lot of students who are more affluent. It does have scholarship students as well. But one of the things that we're excited and we're very happy about is that our two little ones do get to accompany us in our ministry because every Saturday or every other Saturday we do tutoring with our students. We have about 20 of them. Um, there's, there's another tutoring center on the other side of town that have about 60. So we have the smaller group and our daughters come with us every single time that we go and they read books with them, Swahili or English. They practice math problems. Sometimes they get up early ahead of time and write quizzes so that they can, they can quiz um, their friends and they're their friends really. Um, and the tutoring program. Then they get to play games for a little while. Um, and sometimes they actually get to chase monkeys because the monkeys like to come and steal our snacks. <laughs> so it's a fun and wonderful way that I never thought, one of the reasons we went back to mission the second time is because we wanted our children to experience mission, not just to say, hey, I was born in Kenya, look at me, isn't that cool? Um, we wanted them to know, hey, I'm from here. I know these people. I played games with so-and-so and this person, this person. I climbed coconut trees and, and uh, threw rocks at goats or <laughs> whatever they do. Um, and so that has been a huge blessing, is to have our children with us. One of our students, Hamza, um, was one of the first students that we put in school. He's one of the students we put in school when we first got um, involved in the HOPE project. And we spent a lot of time with him because he was eight years old when he first began and didn't know how to read, didn't know how to write. And his grandmother, actually his great-grandmother they lived with, couldn't read or write in any language. Um, and so one of the things that happened just this past year is um, Hamza passed away due to, we think it was dehydration and possibly a preventable sickness. And within the culture and religion, so he was 10 years old this year when he passed. He, he is a Muslim student, and within that religion, a person must be buried within 24 hours of death. So our family, including my two daughters, joined in the mourning and the preparation for the burial with the family, the neighbors, and community. Um, and so we crowded around the small little room that they rented um, and didn't get to see everything but heard the... the I guess the types of chanting that they used and the blessings they used and listened. This was the only time that the women um, and those around could weep. Once, once Hamza was buried, they were no longer allowed to weep. And so it was, you could just hear them heaving and weeping the whole time, and we joined them in that. Um, and I think in those times when you're in mission, in really being with people through life, through death, through daily experiences, you really experience their pain. Um, our quote is, compassion isn't just about feeling the pain of others, it's about bringing them in towards yourself. If we love what God loves, then in compassion, margins get erased. Be compassionate as God is compassionate means the dismantling of barriers that exclude. The same, same day that Hamza passed, um, actually it was during the World Cup, I was um, watching one of the games with my family, um, I had a miscarriage that night. It was our third child. 
And I never felt so connected to the death of a child till that moment. According um, to UNICEF, 29,000 children every day die of preventable diseases. That's 21 children every minute. My experience, my loss, connected me to the loss of Hamza, to his family. All of our experiences, all of our losses, all of our joys, they connect us to people all over the world. We're all humans. We're all of this world. We must restore hope to young people. Help the old, be open to the future, spread love, be poor among the poor. We need to include the excluded and preach peace. Pope Francis. Late last year, 2013, I accompanied one of our salon students, Beverlyn, who is 18 years old, and she completed her certificate course in hairdressing. Beverlyn is HIV positive and struggled off and on with various illnesses with her immune system um, being so weak. In mid-November, some of you might have heard, if I, if I spoke at your theology classes, I talked a little bit about Beverlyn. But while I was here, my husband and the social worker had visited her and her toe had turned black. They took her to the clinic, they sent her home with some ointments. So three, actually about a month later, I came back and wanted to visit Beverlyn as well to see how things were going. Not only was her toe black, it was black up until her mid-calf. I am not a medical professional. I have a major in biology, and if you can ask maybe um, Professor Lecker, we don't really learn <laughs> how to diagnose things. But, but, hopefully as an educated person, maybe mostly for the, through the old fiction books that I read, I had some idea of what gangrene was. And I was like, why isn't she in the hospital? What's happening? And so, um, I talked to her family, and I went with a social worker. I said, we need to figure something out. She is in severe pain. She's been moaning for four days. There are flies all over her body, and she can't move. Something has to be done. So I went to the clinic where she went to. She, this gives you some idea of the healthcare system in Kenya. So I went there. I talked to four professionals, medical professionals, and they all told me, oh, Anita, she's fine. She's getting better. She just needs to put this oil on this gangrenous leg. <laughs> I finally said, okay, no, 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 <laughs> something's wrong here. So I called, fortunately, I'm in community with about nine other missioners in, in Kenya, and one of them is a doctor. She's been a doctor for like 30 years. And so I called her, I said, Susan, this is what I'm looking at, what do I need to do? She's like, get her in the hospital immediately. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> so here I am, non-medical professional, keep that in mind. Um, I'm trying to figure out what to do next, and I do get her into the hospital. Um, the clinic is upset with me. I don't follow necessarily the cultural norm because you don't, you know, tell somebody they've done anything wrong, but they did, and so I told them, and I took her, <laughs> I took her to the hospital. Um, and just long story short, basically she ended up amputating her leg, um, actually above the knee, which was what we feared. Um, that was a whole weekend process. So in the midst of this, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, and I'm thinking, what kind of system is this? What kind of people are these? Um, and realizing that even within all of that frustration, within all of that anger, I did a great thing. Maybe I didn't handle it quite right and quite culturally well, but I started, at one of the things that Susan, who's been in mission much longer than me, about 25 years, she said, Anita, this is the system, <laughs> and we have to work within it. And how we do that is see the goodness that comes from the people during all of it. And so she said that to me um, while I was going through all of that, just through phone calls. And, and the things that I noticed, and I tried to notice, because I was so angry and just so frustrated that someone would let an 18-year-old die, um, I noticed that there are so many staff members from the same clinic that didn't quite treat her the way she should have that would come. They visited her daily. They stayed with her. They massaged her feet. They made her smile. They made her laugh. They brought in medicines. They brought, the hospital had no nets, no water, no nothing. They brought in those little things, and I watched them do that. I watched as her neighbor, her brother, who would stay nights. You can't stay at a hospital without anybody. 
They don't take care of you. Who stayed nights with her to take her to the bathroom, to undress her, to hold her hand. Those were the things they did for her. So although I can get frustrated with the systems, I can get angry at the people that make mistakes and don't want to admit it, there is still compassion. There is still community within all of that. And fortunately, I saw it. I didn't let my anger and my frustration block that. Yet another lesson learned. And then within that, I saw hope. And that was Beverly. She made the decision to cut off her leg. She's made the decision every day to decide, I'm going to try and move around with my crutches. I'm going to try and live, even though I am HIV positive. I just had my leg cut off. I'm living in poverty, but I'm going to do it. She decided that, and she is hope for me. Before I spoke to you tonight, if you've heard anything about Mombasa, you've probably heard about violence, terrorism, or insecurity on the coast. But the terror you hear about in the world is not simply some evil. Terror does not exist in a vacuum. It is a symptom of deeper failures of society, locally, nationally, or internationally. On the Kenyan coast, 41% 40, 41 of the coastal people have not completed elementary education. Only one third of those same students go to secondary or high school. One out of a hundred of those go to university. Then after school, what can they expect? About 55% earn less than $50 a month. These are the root causes. These are the root causes of this terror that we talk about. And what do the terrorist organizations offer? They offer a type of hope because they offer a little bit of money. They offer education. They offer community. They offer work where many times hope doesn't seem to exist for a lot of these students. In the first letter of Paul, it is said, be always ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason concerning the hope that is in you. You need to create rather than ask when confronted by suffering. What are good reasons to hope? The attitude of hope is conviction of the presence of the love of God in our lives and living according to this conviction by creating reasons of hope for other persons and certainly for ourselves. So how do we create hope with all this suffering in Kenya and in the world? This is Dismas Amwandi's story. I wanted to share a story of someone my husband worked with. In Kenya, many times when a crime has occurred, there is no immediate, and there's no immediate evidence of the perpetrator. The police will gather up various people. This happens in South Chicago, too, um, <laughs> just in case you wanted to know. Um, but in Kenya, this happens quite often, in Mombasa. So they'll just grab a bunch of people who they think might be the perpetrator, or maybe their neighbors think that might be the perpetrator. So if you can imagine, if your neighbor doesn't like you, they can say, it's that man, or it's that man, or it's this man. That's generally how it works. Not always. I want to give them some credit, but it does happen a lot. So what happened with, oh, then whomever can, oh, sorry, I forgot about this part. Then whomever can come up with the bail is released and considered innocent, whereas anyone who is left who cannot afford the bail is the perpetrator. So Dismas was wrongly arrested and accused of robbery with violence, which carries a death penalty. He was found guilty and was put in segregation for about nine years. Four years later, he was released after serving 13 years of his life for a crime he did not commit. When he was released, he was given 200 Kenya shillings. That's $2.30. Think back, 13 years of his life. Innocent. Which wasn't even enough money for him to get home from the prison. My husband worked with Dismas actually when he was in the prison and now afterwards. He's, he has been released since. And one of his ministries is prison ministry, he worked with death row prisoners through Marinol lay missioners. Dismas um, was a big source of hope to his fellow prisoners. He was the Catholic leader of the block. 
of about 100 condemned prisoners, and he also served as the jailhouse lawyer, preparing appeals and other legal documentation for, all, for those who were illiterate or simply lacked the needed skills. Dismas was actually the first trained paralegal in prison um, and is credited for securing 250 inmates while he was in prison. After 13 years, he, he was exonerated and freed. And again, $2.30 doesn't bring you much. So he decided to take a job. And where he took a job was at the courthouse, the same courthouse that put him in jail. And he's cleaning the toilets. But that's his job. And he's very proud of it. And on top of cleaning toilets, he volunteers at the prison. He still is a paralegal. He still visits and prays with men's prison, women's prison. Dismisses hope. <laughs> they took 13 years of his life. But he still had joy, he still had hope, and he wanted to give it to others. I can't imagine that. But he does it, and he's someone to me that brings hope to Kenya and brings hope to me and to the community. Compassion, community, and hope have been and still are the three stones that hold up my African pot, full of relationships, places, and experience of mission in Mombasa. I'm still there, by the way. I've got about eight more months of my contract, possibly more. Yet these are the stones and foundations of all of us. Community, compassion, hope. It's one that brings our hearts hopefully closer to those who are excluded, those who are on the margins, and those Three stones can help us build our own homes, our own schools, our own neighborhoods, our own cities. Now we have to create it. We have to create this hope. We have to share this compassion. I chose to do mission overseas. Maybe that is what some of you are called to do, but maybe not. What we are called to do is mission. The mission of Jesus, of our God. That mission is a mission of love, compassion, community, and hope. But mission isn't easy. It's messy and can make you uncomfortable. One of my biggest challenges in mission is dealing with rude and inappropriate men. Sorry to the men in the, in the crowd. But <laughs> it is a daily struggle. And so for me, in hearing lots of different comments, hey baby, give me a kiss, <laughs> gets a little bit on your nerves after you hear it day after day after day. And so as a Christian lay missioner, I thought, okay, I need to handle this in the best way possible because gestures and other words that might want to come out of my mouth aren't always very helpful, nor are they Christian. So <laughs> after speaking with a spiritual director and many other missioners, I thought, let me think. And I actually did take a nonviolence course. So I thought, okay, creativeness. I got to think of creative, creative responses. So one of the things I thought, okay, one of the things they say in church, all Catholics, one of the greetings we give to each other, I said greetings are very important, Catholics will say, um, hold on, Tumsifu Yesu Christu, and the people would respond, Milele na Milele Amina. So Tumsifu Yesu Christu means praise Jesus Christ, and the response is forever and ever, amen. So I thought, okay, well, I'll say it, but just in case the person's a Muslim, I'll use God. So I say, Tumsifu Mungu. So of course, in my daily walk to work, passing the Piki Piki drivers, that's the motorcycle drivers, who usually tend to give me the little bad comments and rude comments. Of course, did the same thing, so I knew what to, what to expect. And I thought, okay, I can do this, I can do this. I'm like, Tumsifu Yesu Christu, or Tumsifu Mungu. The guys looked at me for a second, and then one of them said, Hallelujah! <laughs> <laughs> okay, it worked. And so, as you're laughing now, I laughed that day instead of being frustrated and angry with work. Mission isn't easy, life isn't easy. We all have our little things. Maybe it's somebody in class who's shaking your desk behind you or, I don't know, snoozing away, whatever it is. There's things that annoy us, drive us crazy, we have to be creative. That's life. But in all of that, we have to find creative ways to make it better, to be more compassionate, to be in better relationships, to be more hopeful. So you don't have to be in Kenya to do it. So creating hope, it's not a huge task something we can do daily. And it's our responsibility to do that, to try. And it's through the simple things. So what are those simple things? I know you know some things, so I'm just going to share a few ideas. Um, 
here's, here's, a few, here's just a few ideas. Be friends with people who aren't your age. One thing I tried to do when I was actually in high school, I was a candy striper. I worked in a hospital. I worked with people who were tired. Try it. It's a great way to get to know the stories of people. I still hang out with a lot of married old priests who are like 70 and 80. They're great people to be with. That's my community even in Mombasa. Hang out with people who speak a different language than you. Another simple way. All those global studies students. Get to know someone from outside your culture or social class. That's a little harder to do sometimes. But that's how we see the world. That's how we grow. Don't have to go to Canada. Don't have to go to Bolivia. You can do it right here in Indianapolis or wherever you are from. But what pushes us even more for this mission of God, for mission of Jesus, is to reach out to those who are marginalized, to reach out to those who are poor. It could be any of those people, the ones who speak a, a different language, the ones who, who are of a different age group. But how can you do it? You need to connect yourself somewhere. And it needs to be to one place. Start one place. Don't try to spread yourself out. Choose one thing. Maybe it's tutoring after school in you know, an inner city school. Maybe it's tutoring refugee families. Maybe it's going to a homeless shelter. But don't just do it once, twice, three times. What kind of relationship can you have? Your best friend, how long did it take you to get to know that person? Not once, twice, or three times. It took a long time. Commit to it. Commit to those relationships. Get to know people. Then you never know what will happen. But it will break your heart. It will be messy. It will be frustrating. It will anger you. But it will also give you joy and hope. And that's how you do that. So my last bit of advice is in making those relationships. Sometimes we create this bubble. We're really comfortable in that bubble. It's nice to be at Marion, not to get off campus. Um, sometimes it's nice to be at your home, not to go past your home. But in really making true relationships and to reach out and to live out mission is to make yourself uncomfortable. Just like walking across a rickety bridge. You know you can get to the other side, but it makes you a little uncomfortable. But don't overwhelm yourself. Don't overdo it. It's just a regular pot on three ordinary stones. But once these stones are set, the fire is going, what comes to fruition is a magnificent meal to share with others. Your life is that meal. Your compassion, your relationships, your hope are meant to be shared. There's a common prayer that I'd like to close with that many of you have already heard, but one worth repeating. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing this. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Santi Sana, thank you very much. When you said, you said one out of 100 go to universities, right? Mm -hmm. um, in Kenya, or I guess in your particular area, where do, is there a university to service the school, the kids, I mean the people in your area? Or do yes. they have to go to like another country or? Most, a lot of them go to, to Nairobi. There's a few universities throughout the country. Um, and they're actually chosen. They take this horrid three-week national exam. And whatever grade they get, and whatever topic they do best in, the universities decide. They don't get to decide. So be thankful you could pick your majors and minors. They can't. The universities say, you're going to be an agricultural student. You're going to go here. <laughs> That's kind of how it works. But yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. A 
uh, it's just from a, more of a kind of a, someone interested in political science. Um, you were there in 2007? Just before the election. Okay, and then in 2013? Yes, I was there, for, yes. Okay, so um, the, the 2007 election was extremely violent. It became an ethnic uh, between Luo and Odinga and Kikuyu. And, and then also 2013 was a little bit better. But what, what happened to the community you were working in? Were they all of one ethnic group? Were there tensions? Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, let me, I'm going to, there's a slide that has a little bit. Um, this one might be better, maybe not. Um, so in Kenya, there's about 42 different tribes. Um, the British came in way back when, and they were the ones who made the line. So they kind of put people in different places that they weren't necessarily in before, and also took land away, that kind of thing, not to blame the British. Um, but So there was a lot of things that added to um, this, but on top of that, um, when Kenya took power, um, they wanted to give it to the Kenyans, and so they chose the tribe that they would give it to, <laughs> which is the Kikuyu tribe. Um, and so there's been clashes. Kikuyu and Luo are the main, the biggest tribes, and where the biggest clashes are. But so there's a lot of a lot of fighting. There's a lot of just how we have our own prejudices within our own country. Um, they have prejudice against the 42 tribes. The way you speak, the way your name is spelled, they can tell whether you are a Luo, a Luya, a Kukuyu, uh, from the coast, this person, that person. And then, of course, they all speak their different languages. So, um, yeah, there, everything is about ethnicity. You are in a job. If the person who is hiring you is Luo, they're going to prefer a Luo over a Giriyama. Or if this person is Kikuyu, they're going to prefer this one because they think this person is lazy because that's what they think of that tribe. It's a constant, it's something I don't understand. I read the newspaper at least four times a week and it, it just doesn't all get, because I can't understand it. I am not of the culture. So there's some things I don't think I will ever understand. Politics is one of them in Kenya. Um, also because the newspapers are full of lies. Um, so the, so that, that makes it very difficult. Although they're, they, they're better at telling about American news than I hear from the US. So um, anyway, it is a constant problem. I don't know if they're ever going to get over it. This last election was extremely peaceful. Was it corrupt? Yes. Was the person who is in power the pest person? I don't think so, especially if he's still going to the ICC, Inter International Criminal Court, both the vice president and the president, just in case you're not following politics in Kenya, which you probably aren't. But they are, they are going through this whole process and seem to be hiding a lot of evidence and um, people aren't, witnesses continue to disappear. That's Kenya. <laughs> it, it is one of the top 10 corrupt countries in the world, unfortunately. Um, and again, I wish I could explain more, but it is there. Um, but it is much like our own prejudices here. If, I mean, I, I lived in Chicago for five years, so um, north side, south side, in between, there's a lot of there's a lot of prejudice and a lot of corruption there, too. <laughs> Hi. Um, you had mentioned about the conditions the hospitals were in there. Out of curiosity, where did you give birth and what was your experience in the hospital? Very good question. I went to a private hospital. Um, if I were in the public hospital giving birth, they have bunks, three-tiered. Women are screaming, and the nurses yell back at them. <laughs> um, so if you've ever given birth, you can't imagine. I was in a private hospital, so got to stay and look over the ocean for four days. <laughs> so a lot different, a lot different. Anita, um, thank, first of all, thank you. Really happy to have you back here. Um, when you come back, how do you think your children will adjust since most of their life has been in Kenya? At least their more, uh, their older life, I should say. So, I, I don't know, I guess we'll see, but um, first off, they're gonna have a British Kenyan accent. Um, <laughs> as my best friend just talked to them today, she's like, wow. Um, 
You know, funny enough, one thing that I think will probably happen is their best friends will probably be of African descent probably right away because that's who they're comfortable with. Um, they will probably, um, I don't know, it might take a little while. There's a lot of choices here. I just went to the mire the other day. <laughs> it's a bit overwhelming. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, it can be overwhelming. Transition for me, coming back to the US, is overwhelming. Um, the choices we have, um, school's a little different. They go to an international baccalaureate pro, um, program curriculum, which is excellent. Um, before that, we were in the Chicago public school system. Nothing against the Chicago public school system, but wow, it's a huge difference um, between that. So I don't know. I, I do think they're going to be, um, from their school and from all of their interactions with people, I can imagine that they are going to have a lot of friends of diverse background. Um, they did even before we left. We went to a very diverse um, Chicago public school. Um, one best friend was Vietnamese. One best friend was Indian. Um, so I, I just, that's what I hope for them, and that's what I've always hoped. And I know one of them already says she wants to learn Spanish <laughs> when she comes back, so I think that's great. But otherwise, I don't know. I, I, I hope for the best, and the, the reason why we brought them there is because that we want them to be open to people. Um, we want them to be open to experiences, and we want them to know what poverty is. We have it here, but it's, it's, it's just crazy bad in Kenya. I don't even know how else to explain it. It's just very different. And they know that. And it's, it's, they've seen that. And they play with these friends who live in that. Um, and they've washed dishes with those sa same friends in their homes. I think that hopefully will be a part of their lives and at least help them make decisions that might, you know, help to improve that or connect them to those experiences. So I have a question. Um, how did you and your husband decide that you wanted to do missionary work? We were actually here at Marion. Um, it's my senior year. I was pre-med biology, and somewhere end of junior year, I took organic chemistry. <laughs> the, the professor was very nice and gave me a C. I should have gotten an F. Um, <laughs> So I had a little bit of a freak out and said, oh my God, what am I going to do with my life? That's where it started. And so I thought, I need to take a break. <laughs> Don't want to go to grad school right away. I want to do something else. Kurt and I were dating. Somewhere around there we broke up. But we talked about that as a couple. And so we broke up. And then both of us decided to do mission anyway on our own. Kurt ended up in Birmingham, Alabama, um, working with inner city kids. And I was in Bolivia. Um, but it was of a, a desire to do something. I didn't know what I wanted to do next, but I wanted to do something. Um, and I thought learning a language, being with orphans, kind of understanding the world a little bit means I need to be somewhere. And so, and a lot of it was my faith. I, from freshman year, I went on that spring break trip, and every, ever since then I did that. Um, did mentoring in the city with my lovely friend Beth Reilly here, who worked here. Um, doing that and worked with inner city kids here in Indianapolis. That was a part of my life. Um, tore down walls and did things and went on retreats. My faith brought me there. Um, God brought me there, my relationship, what I did. What, I mean, even, I re even remember um, Father Brian. Is that Father Brian who taught moral, morality? I even remember him. So, there's some certain scripture
you know, if it's my time to die, it's my time to die. Like, okay. And she said, I'm right with God. It's all good. So I guess, you know, our, if, it's, if it's my time, it's my time. Um, but I am cautious. <laughs> I check with friends before things happen. I don't hang out in discos anymore. <laughs> um, I don't hang out. Um, you know, in some of the places that it happens. But at the same time, it could happen anywhere. But quite honestly, I was more scared in Chicago <laughs> than I was in Mombasa, or have been in Mombasa. <laughs> uh, did you ever get homesick? <laughs> Always. <laughs> I miss the food and the berries and the apples. Um, yeah, yeah, especially when I had my babies, I was very homesick. I've been fortunate all of our family members have come to visit us. Um, and I've got one more who's coming in December. That helps. Skype is a wonderful thing. Um, Facebook keeps everybody connected. Um, and just telling our stories with our family, um, that's good. My parents are, are retired and they're in the Philippines. So in that way, I don't get to, um, I wouldn't have gotten to hang out with them anyway. But um, like I said, home is wherever you, you find home. So I, I have a lot of extended community. The, the, the two other lay missioners, one's 70 and one's 55, they're kind of like our surrogate mothers. I mean, they, they are my kids' aunties. And um, when we meet, we're actually going to be meeting at the end of November. All of the lay missioners in Kenya gather together. There's about 10 of us with the Marino fathers, the Marino sisters. We celebrate Thanksgiving together. We pray together, we go on a social outing, we drink together. Um, <laughs> you know, I have family. Um, I have family here too, and I miss them. But at the same time, I'm surrounded by people who love me, support me, and have the same values as I do. And, and that's important. And, you know, that, I'm very lucky to have a job that I can say the people I work with are my family. Thank you.